So um, over to you, Crawford. Thanks, Sue. Hello, everybody. Hope you're all doing well. And this is a lovely morning. Um, I want to talk in, in a very short time uh, about Beyond Nudge and trying to talk a little bit about unlocking the strategic power of BE, which is what we do in the behavioral architect. Um, I think really, to, to state the obvious, there is a huge buzz uh, around the behavioral sciences, and particularly around BE. And I haven't seen such a level of expectation in our industry for, I suppose, you know, 20 years, which has been a long time since people have been so excited. I think anybody listening to this call will be well aware of all the new powerful insights about how our brain functions or why we may behave one way, why we may behave another, why we might think one thing um, versus another, or why ultimately we may buy one thing versus another. Um, I'm sure, I'm sorry, I need someone to move my slide forward. It's not actually going so. Thank you. Um, I think we're all very, so, oh, no, back. Um, sorry. So I think everyone, as I say, is aware of all these new powerful insights, and it's a glorious time to be a brain. Uh, I know in our, in our company, and actually in my house, and my wife also studies the brain, is every day there is a new paper uh, or a new book published with another incredible insight into, into the human brain, into human behavior, into a cognitive bias, and it's fantastic. You know, brilliant books that I'm sure you're all aware of, and if you're not, go and buy them, such as Thinking Fast and Slow by the wonderfully grandfatherly Daniel Kahneman, The Optimism Bias, another one I love, particularly by Tali Sharo. And if you haven't heard of the recent one by the delightful Susan Cain, which is called Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop, <laughs> can't stop Talking, um, which I nearly did then, uh, which is great for anyone who works in the open plan office, believe me. But whilst we've seen all these column inches, all these books, given this new understanding, this huge kind of importance, many people that we talk to and many people we do business with still feel, you know, they weren't sure how to embrace the learning practically and how to unlock this incredible power uh, of behavioral economics at a deeper strategic level in our day-to-day -day jobs. Um, but before, before going on to, to talk a little bit about this, um, I wanted to give you what I call my elevator pitch, because everyone gets bogged down in neuroscience and behavioral science and BE and putting electrodes on one's heads. Um, but in a sense, at base camp, there are only a number of things we need to take on board uh, at base camp one. Uh, number one, we are all cognitive misers, or, or if you want to call it, cognitively efficient. Um, much of what influences our behavior is subconscious and below the surface. Pretty fundamental thing in terms of our jobs. Number two, we're hugely influenced by the context around us, you know, and a different context around us. And we use anchors, we use shortcuts, we use rules of thumb to navigate these contexts and to make the decision. Again, a really interesting architectural point. And number three, we're also subject to this whole plethora of what we call cognitive biases, such as herd instinct or loss aversion. Uh, which gives us tendencies, essentially, to behave in certain ways. You know, our brains are wired to behave with a tendency in certain ways, and these are often irrational, and we've read loads about that. So you ask yourself the question, um, next slide, please, how does this affect you know, our, day, you know, our day jobs? And it reminds me, and I hope people are, are as old as me to remember, Monty Python's and the life of Briar or as we call it in our company, the life of brain. So what have the Romans ever given us, they exclaimed. Well, as I think you'll see, quite a lot. Because at its core, behavioral economics challenges and inspires how we fundamentally think about consumer behavior and how we think about behavioral change, which I think for most of us is key to our jobs. It also challenges and inspires the very questions we should ask or actually seek to understand from the consumer. And beautifully, it provides the frameworks for how we structure, how we analyze, and how we present research. So, and of course, it gives us a myriad of exciting concepts for, make, for making sense of what we see 
else in this complex world. So how do we use this new breakthrough understanding or these new frameworks? Well, I'd like everybody to try and hold on to a really simple thought for me as we go through the next kind of 15 minutes. I want you to think about applied BE level one, level two. I want you to think about level one being much more executional and level two being much more, much more strategic. And both of them are all about action to that, what you do with this thinking. So, moving on to, to talk a little bit about level one. Well, I mean, again, quite, quite simply on level one, the executional level, BE gives us a behavioral toolkit for nudging or steering, whatever word you want to use, behavior in certain directions that can very easily create simple behavioral wins. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, why are they trying oh, there we go. Excellent. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this today um, because, again, uh, these are all, as you can see by some of these visuals, these are just some cognitive biases and or what I call brain strategies, and they're well documented. And, and in fact, if anyone is interested in reading more into this level one, then just go on to the Market Society or Research Live blogs, uh, put in my name, Paul Collingworth, and push search, and you'll find 20 to 30 articles come up uh, about this level one application. Uh, if you look at these, you'll see so many examples of just simple things like how governments and companies have used these cognitive insights to make you fill in a form, uh, oh, to attend a hospital appointment, uh, to get out and vote, to buy a magazine subscription, to save money, even to pick up litter. Uh, you'll see that we're awash with people playing with our brain wiring to nudge or steer us in the directions they choose. Why? Because it's simple to apply and it works at this executional level. Just look at this next slide at booking.com as my last example. Um, as we move on to this, this is, this is a wonderful example of actually trying to use as many as you possibly can. Can I have the next slide, please? I apologize for the delay, everybody. He's now gone two slides forward. We go back one slide. Uh, as I said, on this, on this great example, use, the use of the, we can see they're using the power of now. They tell us, someone else called 10 minutes ago. They leverage social norms by telling us 20 others are looking at this hotel and that it has an 8.4 out of 10 rating average from nearly 300 reviews. Wow, I'm saying. And finally, they make us push that book, that room, by tapping into our scarcity bias and loss aversion by telling us there are only X rooms left at that rate. I'm sure we've all been influenced by that. So moving beyond that, though, these are what I would call simple, powerful, um, level one wins. But BE and the behavioral sciences actually provide us with much, more, much deeper tools with new constructs, with new frameworks to actually analyze consumer behavior. Uh, and this is what we call level two applied BE, these new constructs, these new tools, these new frameworks to analyze consumer behavior. And I want to talk about this in slightly, in, in slightly more detail. detail. Um, first, uh, moving on to my next slide, uh, first, what I want to say is it directs us to focus our understanding, our consumer understanding, around behavioral versus attitudinal journey. So you spend a lot more time thinking about you know, what is happening on that behavioral journey. It also provides us with this incredible, powerful strategic framework of what we call architecture for how you actually investigate and define that very journey. Because it also, on top of that, gives us this great set of constructs that you all know so well, to make sense of that complex consumer behavior we see. And you know what? It's all beautifully underpinned by the integrity of science, which is rather lovely for our industry. What BE also does is direct us very strongly to consider a much wider 
holistic view of the influences of behavior, you know, and not to get over-focused on one particular context, you know, such as purchase or, you know, or consumption. You need to consider all of the different contexts around a piece of behavior, because influence can come from many different streams. And much too often in our business, I see people who are over-focused on the moment and can miss some fundamental behavioral trigger or barrier in a different context. At the Behavioural Architects, um, to help us with this, we've developed a strategic model which breaks out the different contexts around an individual, uh, being very mindful that different contexts can be more powerful at different times. And I'd like to share uh, this strategic tool or framework uh, with you today. Um, so moving on to, uh, this will take a little bit of time to build this chart. Um, so let me just move it slightly forward. In this model, we, we literally sit back and we start saying, okay, what is, on a contextual map, what is the target consumer's behavioral journey? Um, we think about what are the potential triggers and barriers that influence this journey, both conscious and subconscious. We think about what is the social and cultural context that surrounds an individual, and what are the potential macro societal trends which might be shaping, you know, or shaping the norms or behavior around that person. We also tend to think about what is the purchase context. You know, what are the different situational drivers of behavior, such as in store or online. To go one stage further, what is the consumption or the various consumption contexts we need to unlock and understand. Uh, that are taking place, or the different behavioral influences at play in those different consumption contexts. And finally, we ask ourselves, okay, what about the brand context? context? In the brand context, what are the brand cues operating? What are the brand shortcuts operating that are shaping and directing that consumer behavioral journey? And we sit back and we think about all this, and what, what we end up with, as I hope you can see on this very quick overview, is a wide holistic model that essentially brings alive the architecture of consumer choice. And essentially, the architecture of consumer behavior, and by default, behavioral change. And when you start talking about understanding the architecture of behavior, and behavioral change, believe me, everybody gets excited. On a much more practical level, um, if you look at this model, it also directs how you set up and go about conducting research and analyzing consumer data. So very simply, for instance, when approaching, say, a client challenge, using this sort of approach, you need to spend a lot of time up front defining what is the behavioral challenge? Talking to a client to say, what is it we're trying to do? What is that behavioral challenge? And this often involves a really interesting session where you develop behavioral change hypotheses, which bring to life some of those potential triggers, some of those potential barriers to behavior. Then, for instance, when you structure a methodology, if you look at this model, you have to think really hard about how you can un understand and how you can unlock insights around these. You know, each context may need a slightly different unlocking methodology to surface the most relevant insights. And that's really exciting to think about how you unlock that. And in many cases, you might bring in an expert an expert eye. You know, again, you know, as I think Clint Eastwood said, a man has got to know his limitation and bringing in expert eyes to help code and decode some of these behaviors we're observing is incredibly refreshing and giving us a really new perspective. And we've used, you know, we've used financial behavioral experts from around the world. We've used brand semioticians to help further define brand cues and shortcuts. Anyone that can help bring alive and define this wonderful choice architecture. And on a very, very practical level, B tells us the most behavioral influences are subconscious, as I'm sure everyone here knows. And it challenges us to think much more creatively and much more laterally 
but how do you really unlock true consumer insight? And so we spent a lot of time working you know, uh, with academics, developing methodologies we can use in both you know, qualitative and quantitative research, using advanced behavioral priming techniques and advanced disruption techniques which, with the simple aim to unearth behavioral triggers, to unearth behavioral barriers, and to surface both conscious and subconscious drivers of behavior. It sets up this wonderful kind of experimental mindset, which is very exciting in the research one does. Um, on my next chart, please. Using, uh, using this contextual uh, uh, sort of strategic framework, is an incredibly uh, inspirational way to think obviously more deeply about consumer behavior uh, and think about behavioral change. And specifically, I wanted to give you an idea about the things you can use it for. So we look at it simply at looking at a consumer behavioral journey as you saw in the whole model and the conscious and subconscious triggers and barriers. You've got that framework. If someone says to you, let's define the choice architecture that is operating around a category or brand, by doing that in this model can be very inspirational in terms of do I want to develop new positionings or new strategies for my brands. It also has an opportunity to develop what we call a behavioral opportunity map. And again, the word is very key here being behavior. And it's worked incredibly well for us for innovation because for innovation, if you take this wider holistic model, it will deliver insights which basically can address and inspire every aspect of the MPD process because you get insights which, which can inspire product, packaging, distribution, and communication because of that wider footprint. And you know, as a company, as you know, it's, it's, core, it's the core of our company. We use this framework to inspire new approaches across lots of sectors. We've used it from you know, trying to optimize new global breakfast MPD concepts around the world, identifying both what we call conscious and subconscious behavioral footholds. We've used it to identify the behavioral drivers behind retail banking and credit card behavior. We've used it to investigate you know, new e-commerce propositions, and even to uncover insights about snacking brands and how they can succeed in lower tier cities in China, and how very different it is to tier one and two cities, how the context is critical, and this model unlocks at different contexts. So in, in, in summary, um, because time is short, um, what I'd really like to say, moving to the next slide, please, it, is that B really does inspire and direct one's thinking on a deeper strategic level, uh, and is an incredibly powerful tool if used correctly. Obviously, on kind of level one, it can be used in like this simple executional. So please take that away today. The simple executional level, you know, playing to cognitive biases, looking at ways to nudge or steer a person's behavior. But as a company, when, when we really get excited, grab the next slide please, when we really get excited is when it provides this deeper strategic level that I try to bring alive with a strategic model and the way you can use that to help your thinking. Because this is when BE comes out of the box. Because again, quite, quite simply, it encourages us to consider not only a person's behavioral journey and the influence of the different contexts, it challenges us to think about how to surface and explore conscious and subconscious behavioral influences and to develop new techniques, new tools that we can use in our day jobs, which believe me, are incredibly exciting. And it also helps us deliver to our clients dynamic maps, dynamic moving maps of consumer behavior that bring alive penetrating insights into how a habit is formed and how a habit is broken. And again, really powerful language. We become the experts of habit formation and change. And overall, it provides this inspirational framework and this wonderful set of constructs for thinking about consumers, for thinking about behavior, for thinking about a brand's positioning, or defining a new potential innovation space, or mapping the choice architecture operating in a category. And to be really honest, you know, 
if anyone is interested in behavior, if anyone is really interested in behavioral change, then really they should believe in BE. Now the last slide, please. Thank you very much for listening to me. I hope that uh, inspires some people.